Hello, so welcome everyone to Skills Boost from the Centre for Academic Achievement. This is our weekly conversation with our very own expert guests from across the University of Leicester. Um, every week we're sharing different topic and theme related to academic skills and life at Leicester. Um, and we hopefully get to share great ideas and insights from our experts. So this week, um, I'm Sarah and I'm hosting and our topic is AI or generative AI, what's allowed and what's good practice. So I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Kareem Muola. He's Associate Professor at the School of Computing and Mathematical Sciences. His research is on leveraging AI for higher education, developing adaptive learning systems for information systems management. And he also focuses on cloud computing, complex decision making and technology innovation management. And also in his spare time, he has a number of distinguished teaching fellowships. And that's even before you started work. So that's very <laughs> so in the context of all of that, um, um, I'm just going to start with a general question, really. You've got lots of experience of AI, both from your research and teaching students in a university environment. So in, in this experience that you have, um, how is AI changing how students approach learning? Well, thank you very much for having me uh, and a very kind introduction. Just to say, when you have extensive research, uh, generative AI became a hot topic in 2023. So if anyone says they have extensive research in that debate, <laughs> yeah, exactly. then that's a red line, that's a flag <laughs> at the beginning. So very humble experience, but obviously I worked uh, in adaptive learning. That was my scholarship research. Adaptive learning relies heavily on AI. And that one thing we'll, we'll talk about in a second, and that started from like 2016, uh, way before ChatGPT and all these platforms uh, became live. But yes, uh, to to start with your first question, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very hot topic right now. It's affecting everybody in a positive way from an opportunity perspective, but also what can be an incredible learning tool for students can also be a major challenge for, for teachers, for educators, and for, and for different industries that see their jobs transform and, and tasks within the job transform. So it's a collective population uh, issue that everybody's best interest to, to learn more about and know how to become an expert in. Uh, in terms of what benefits them. So when it comes to, to education, to higher education in general and, and learning, almost, almost everything in life today is based on individualized advice. Everything, every aspect in life today yeah. is based on individualized advice. So why shouldn't education also not be individualized? Uh, one of the key advantages of, of using artificial intelligence, and by the way, we, we can go technical because I, can, I come from computer science. So there's a big difference between large language models breakthrough via the transformer uh, breakthrough, which is an outstanding thing. But there's a big difference between that and AGI, artificial general intelligence, artificial general yeah. intelligence. They're, they're built on different architecture and they do different things. So it, it is the, important to distinguish some terminologies that, that they are different. So when we say AI, we're, we're more referring to the, the transformer breakthrough for, for large language models, not AGI, which we will come to in a second as well. Um, one of the key things that education can greatly benefit from, from artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, all the things that large language models rely on, is personalized learning, being mm -hmm. individualized to the student. Every student has a completely different neurocognitive profile. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have different abilities. They come from different backgrounds. They have different skill levels in different areas in life. Mm -hmm. They have different attention spans. They have different habits. They have different industry uh, concentrations for the future, even though they might have chosen a specific program for their industry objectives, but they have different interests within that industry. And this is where AI can come in. We can personalize the learning experience. By the way, I happen to be someone who surveys students a lot <laughs> when it comes to my scholarship research. And one of the fascinating things that I found out when I surveyed a lot of students, uh, 150, I think, in the last survey of computer science students. So these are more computer science. About what what do you believe the, the, the best use of the AI tools that you currently have for education? And it was interesting to me to hear keywords such as a 24-7 personal tutor. This was really interesting. A 24-7. 24-7. So anytime I need a personal tutor, that's there. Uh, a brainstorming partner. 
a brainstorming partner, uh, a study buddy, a study buddy. Mm -hmm. These things made me realize of what how students are thinking about this. But by the way, the number one search item of how to use ChatGPT AI is how to make money. So, so education was not was not on the it's table. A different the holy grail. It was like, huh, <laughs> give me a successful business idea. And then, then when it comes to education, that was like the second, third thing on their mind is how can I maximize the efficiency of education, boost productiveness, automate repetitive tasks. So there's there's a big debate to this obviously we're not going to address all the psychological ethical and, and and technical aspects of each one but but this is from a high level now this is just to answer your your first question in in a nutshell like they said yeah so um so there's lots of exciting possibilities that you could have this kind of personalization and um you could almost go completely at your own pace and i guess that's one of the issues with education it's always had to be a kind of standardized thing um to Fit all people um, have to fit into this. Um, do you think they've students have started? I mean, you. So I'm thinking you're teaching in computer science, so perhaps your students are, or are they? This is, could be an assumption. I'm assuming that your students are a bit more advanced in taking to AI for their learning, but I may be totally wrong. Not, not all of them. So I'm currently also teaching. One of the modules I'm teaching is technology innovation management. Mm -hmm. innovation man how to manage innovation in 2024 right. a very complex so this is someone who's thinking as a decision maker as a business mm -hmm. management right. but some of the programs that are taken some of the modules are computer scientists yes but we're i teach other technical computer science modules but th this one for example is in the domain of mis management information mm -hmm. systems and it's it, it could it could be anybody okay and so in your experience uh, have you seen a difference in how they're the kind of work they're producing, I guess. I mean, I, I know you talk to students a lot about how they use AI anyway, so you, you've probably got a lot of insights about that you could share with people today and what students are doing, and then whether or not you think it's made a difference to their learning, if you're seeing results from that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, again, I survey students a lot about their use of AI, and it's always fascinating to me to see the results of that. It's, uh, one of the, the quick questions that I ask students is, how many of you have used AI in the last 24 hours. Almost 99.9% .9 said one student yeah. was like, I'm using AI while you're talking to summarize your points. So, yeah. <laughs> so we got we gotta remember that our students are much more sophisticated technology users than we give them. Humans in general are, are much more sophisticated mm -hmm. technology users than we give them credit to be. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting for educators like me and others, even if you don't you don't research this or you don't worry about this a lot. Um, students when they come from A levels, GCSE and, and, the, and the colleges before they've already used these technologies. They've already been exposed to these technologies, these tools. And when you, they come to universities, higher education in general, you have a certain level of sophistication in how to use these tools. So obviously educators, teachers should be on top of the, their game when it comes to that because yeah. they are very good technology users. And the availability of these tools is exponentially expanding at a rapid pace. It's called the pace uh, in technology management. We have a term called the, the dance of humanity, the, the, the innovation pace dilemma, is when we are so good at creating things efficiently, but we, we want to do things faster then we can do them efficiently, so we end up making them worse. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yes, so, we've all experienced that. <laughs> every phone you have today, every mm -hmm. tablet you have, the, the, the new iPad math, uh, 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 it's called the AI Galaxy, uh, sorry, it's called the AI Notes and the new iPad. Mm -hmm. the, 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 they are do, uh, introducing tools that are making the access to this much more easier. However, it increases the number of challenges that students can face. And this is where we come in. So one of the proposals, obviously, uh, that, that I'm, I've been working on is to have a module, a module university-wide of how to use AI efficiently, how to actually be the prompt. There is a debate today that the actual innovation is, or, or, or the actual uh, intelligence is in the prompt engineer. 
at the LLM. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that, about what skills you think are the ones we should be focusing on and actually prompting is the one that always comes to mind. And is that the skill we should be focusing on? And it's not as easy as it may sound. If you remember 10 years ago in, in, in major companies, by the way, I, in addition to being an academic, I come from the industry. So I've worked in private industry, computer science. So I, I kind of know how they think and how they approach these technologies. And it's one of those things where, do you remember uh, Googling? There used to be a skill. Yeah. Like in a company <laughs> 10 years ago, if someone is very good at Googling, at Google, at doing the research through Google, that's a skill. In, in, in large language models, asking the right question is mm. a skill. Mm. Because large language models, they are feeding us back to us based on, they're only as good as the data you put in them. And they're extraordinary, by the way, extraordinary. And as a computer scientist, I'm someone who's not easily impressed and my God, I've been impressed in the last few months in some mm -hmm. things that I can share with you later on. Mm -hmm. But but it's one of those things where asking the right question is a skill. And that's just one of them. I mean, we can go through many, many other things as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see. Yeah, asking the right questions. But you also need to understand a bit about what's going on behind it to know what questions to ask, I suppose. So you do need a bit of con context, I guess. Yes. So I guess that leads on then um, to perhaps what a good what would you recommend to your students or what do you recommend to your students as a good way to use AI to help you learn? Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I just published a, a Springer book chapter about this, and it's one of those things where that's like asking, what are the good things I can do with my smartphone? Mm -hmm. Countless, countless things. <laughs> but to, to, to actually focus this in a way that, that is more relevant to higher education and, and things that, based on my humble research recently, there would be some conclusion points, let's say. You can personalize your study plans, like AI, using AI-driven applications that can create tailored study schedule based on strengths, weaknesses, deadlines, helping you to manage time, focus on areas needing improvement, on-demand tutoring, which is one of the things that I mentioned in the surveys that I've done, AI chatbots, for example, tutoring system, can clarify concepts for you quicker than you would normally have access to. Answer questions, provide instant feedback. Now, I'm not ever saying replace that with the feedback that you get from your tutors. We'll talk about that in a second, but this is the study buddy aspect. Uh, available whenever you need it. And sometimes you do want something quickly, depending on the circumstance. Content summarization. By the way, summarizing content is a very underrated breakthrough for large language models. Note-taking tools, like mm -hmm. summarizing transcripts, services that can uh, condense lectures, reading materials, notes, making review sessions faster and more focused. Sometimes as an, as an educator, I want my students to read a references list, but they don't have time to do so. Well, now with AI summarization, they can actually condense some of these information in a very effective way. But again, we have to teach them how to do it efficiently because they can get lost. Also, practice tests and feedback formative. From a formative perspective, AI can generate instant quizzes, tests to practice and assess knowledge. Again, assess knowledge, not replace the actual test that you have. Adjusting difficulty based on your progress, providing detailed feedback. And most importantly, because we are a research intensive university, we, our research inspired education, in my opinion, is one of our strong points here at, at Leicester. AI powered applications or software or tools like natural language processing can help you find, organize, analyze academic papers, sources, relevant research topics that are related to something that you do need some sort of a creativity push. I mean, I can give you an example if you want a recent example that kind of blow my mind. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, so, so there's something called explainable AI, right? It's one of AI, XAI. So there was, uh, let me give an example, a quick example of how this was so effective when it comes to research in research in intensive universities. There is a, there is a rare aluminium based quasi crystal. That's what it's called, I believe, quasi crystal. It, it was mathematically proven and then discovered, but it's very rare to find. Only exists in meteors and almost impossible to find on Earth. So they asked AI, where can I find it on Earth? Where should I look 
And it was interesting, very interesting when AI answered, have you considered lightning strikes on a specific type of mines called broxide mines, I believe? I, I can look it up. And, and then AI continued by saying, by the way, you might want to go to Venezuela. Why? Because they have a lot of lightning strikes and they have these types of mines. Now, this is AGI. This is artificial general. I was going to say, it probably wasn't chat GPT. <laughs> no, but it was the prompt. It was the prompt, but using, using um, a, a demonstrated human cognitive knowledge as a simulation of, what, of how to use new data to make, uh, sorry, old data to make new conclusions. That's what AGI is, basically. Yeah. yeah. Large language models are synthesizing languages and and making and working very hard, by the way, to speak like us, which which is not easy because ironically, large language models are very bad at language, but they are very good at detecting patterns of data from large data sets, and there are breakthroughs. But but this one about the aluminium quasi crystal, it was fascinating because the human who was doing that research was like. Actually, I could have I could have concluded that myself, but it would have taken me maybe another year to do so. Mm-hmm. But this made it very efficient, so it boosted productivity. It's just an example. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's a great example. I can imagine. I'm sure medicine will have lots of breakthroughs um, as well. Geology, um, actually, this, yeah. was, a, this Ge- was a geology, but geology. medicine has other other. Yeah, great, yeah. yeah great. So do you envisage um, a kind of this kind of personalized digital assistant that you could have? Could that be one that um, existed? So you could have a sort of university one that existed on our, say, Blackboard or something like that, um, that kind of worked alongside students. Or would you have people come with their own personal digital assistant that they would have or both? Or how do you kind of see some kind of future that we could be in in 10, 15 years time? 10, 15 years time. That's too I was, I thought you were going to say two, <laughs> two three months. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. So fast ago. 10, 15 years time, we'll be using the Optimus Tesla robot to, to, to clean the, the laundry or something. <laughs> 10, 15 years is a very long time when it comes to a disruptive innovation uh, such as that. But, but, but yeah, you're, this is a great question, by the way, because you know, they, they say in innovation management, the one thing that never loses is technology. T- technology will always go at a... F- so when, when you look at year by year, it looks chaotic, like a lot of disruptions, things collapsing, things advancing, companies going out of business, companies uh, arising. But when you zoom out decade by decade, it has all... Th- these advancements have always been... Uh, a byproduct of technology consistency through a sustained pattern of evolution. Always, always. Mm -hmm. So all you got to do is try to predict the future as much as you can. But when you have what we call discontinuous innovation, where it's creating something completely new, then you have an argument of, is it a tool or is it an agent? These two, there's debates right now happening in top conferences in artificial intelligence. There's papers, you, you'll find papers published today that AI is just a tool. And then you'll find other papers saying, no, no AI is an agent. So what was the difference? A, a tool is something that performs specific functions to, to achieve specific tasks. An agent is what runs the tool. So mimic human behavior, the action of doing the thing. So technology never loses. And it's one of those things where, um, if, if, if back to your question, how would you control the accessibility of that? The short answer is you don't. You can't because it's available for free. Asking someone if, have you used AI to do something in a few years time will be like asking you today, have you used electricity? to do your homework. Like, duh, of course I've used electricity. It's a tool, it's available, it's a utility. I can not use electricity, but that would be just, you know, not very smart. So you you can control as much as possible, but we as educators, and we are on the front line of this, We, if we don't have answers to this, who's going to have answers? Uh, What we, we can do is make sure to leverage this agent or tool to improve productivity and efficiency of what we are already good at. We're already very good at higher education. That's why people come to us. But what we can do it 10 times better sometimes using these tools, but you will always have 
challenges, big challenges. And I'm pretty sure everyone who's listening to me right now is like, Karim, you're being very positive. That's so positive. But what about all the challenges that comes with that? Well, I'll tell you one thing. In the 1990s, one of the biggest industries in computer science was antiviruses, the antivirus companies. Because when the internet became a thing, which was the most frightening disruptive technology for higher education, by the way, when they said there's going to be no longer libraries, uh, that's it, we're done, everything is on the internet. No, but it was very uh, fearful type of period. However, uh, the, the, the aspect of that is what, what you want to do is maximize efficiency, automate repetitive tasks. So it, it, it ingenuity, creativity becomes the focus of education. Now, when it comes to educators, we can have a whole different podcast of how to use AI to, to embed it in your education. But that's a different topic. I think this one is more for students and how they use it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, well, I was going to come to a slightly more negative question. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. So um, if you were um, talking to your students, um, what is the worst thing you could do with AI if you're a student um, for your, from the point of view of just your learning and development? What would you yeah. not to recommend? <laughs> what not to do, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in technology innovation, there's something called the techno shock principle. The techno shock principle is when you have a new disruptive innovation, uh, it starts with fear and uncertainty from the mm. user base, and then it goes to acceptance after a while and then it goes to integration so mm -hmm. you start to integrating with your day-to-day -day. and then it goes to the final step which is called cannot live without <laughs> <laughs> it's called the missing limb syndrome it's like when you leave the house today without your phone you feel like oh my god i have to go back to get the phone it's like it's called the missing limb syndrome mm -hmm. it's like you, you 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 don't have an arm or something and that would have been unthinkable once <laughs> unthinkable yeah but if you think about it really like we don't i I love my time when I'm without my phone for a while. It's actually a great thing. We'll talk about that later. It's called digital cleansing. <laughs> but anyway, what not to do, right? So what not mm -hmm. to do is a very big topic, and I have been researching this. So I'm just going to summarize some points. Like, number one, over-reliance on AI for assignments. Copying, pasting AI-generated content mm -hmm. without understanding can lead to a shallow learning experience for you, mm -hmm. potentially plagiarism or cheating or dishonest type uh, 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 content creation. Uh, but, but by the way, if you use generative AI to write an essay, that's a guarantee that you will never learn how to write an essay. I mean, obviously, the, the era of an essay is over. Like, if th th that should that type of question should transform now. It's not, and, and I've given many talks about that. We can talk about that later. And by the way, just for anybody who does use AI blindly, as they say, because I did survey a lot of students, I always say this in my lectures. I say, keep in mind, every company you ever work for has something called a probation period. <laughs> a probation period. And I used to hire programmers and developers in our e-commerce agency when I used to work in the industry all the time. Everything gets clarified in the probation period. It's not just the degree that you have, it's how you got it. And it's one of those things where your employer, your future employer, will immediately tell if you have relied on copying and pasting things from, from sources or you have the ingenuity, the, the decision-making ability, reinforce your brain wiring when you're faced with a new problem in life using old data and making conclusions in new, using new knowledge to actually make these conclusions. These things are very obvious. Another thing is avoiding critical thinking, relying on AI for answers rather than engaging with the material. When we give you learning material, it's to engage with it, not to train AI. You know, I made, I made this joke once in, in another podcast. I said, you know, I, I, I told my student as a joke, I know you wrote it using ChatGPT. Well, guess what? I'm going to mark it using ChatGPT. So it's a, it's, a, it's a silly joke, but guess it has a philosophical background to it. If AI is writing the assignment, and marking the assignment, then who's doing the learning here? That's, that's, a, that's an important question. Who's doing the learning? Okay, neglecting time management. When you rely on AI to cramp last minute study or assignment, it may result in what, what we refer to in education, surface level knowledge, surface level knowledge, impacting performance and retention. Ignoring AI limitations. I have a whole lecture that I can give in another podcast on AI limitations, fact checking, 
the hallucination, the ability of not saying, I don't know. Machine learning algorithms don't know what they don't know. They don't use, they, they use similar techniques to the human brain using interconnected neurons and neural networks, but they're always spitting out the next word. We as a human, we plan, we plan what we're going to say. Large language models don't do that. They just have a prediction mechanism, which we can talk about later on. So ignoring AI limitations, assuming AI outputs are always correct without verifying sources, it can lead to misinformation and errors in assignments. And by the way, this is very easily detectable by educators. Using AI, for example, to shortcut academic integrity, employing AI for exam answers, essay, dishonest practices, risk academic penalties. I always tell my students, you do not want to have the burden of worrying about whether you'll be flagged as plagiarism or cheat. Just if someone tells you in our traffic light system, don't use AI for this particular assessment, we have a pedagogical reasoning behind that. We do want you to just do it yourself. You know, of course, you can use AI to summarize content, to learn, to, to, to reinforce any language barrier you have, to boost efficiency in maybe literature review reading, but not to do the work for you. I, I'll give you a quick example. I have a student, uh, I had a student uh, last year. He graduated, he's mm -hmm. still with us. Uh, and that student was, was really high performing, really great student, but he has a very unfortunate shortcoming, which is the language barrier. His English was not good at all. It's from a different mm -hmm. country. He had English, English issues. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated of how this student used AI to improve his language. To, to, to do translation, to do summary in a different tone. Sometimes if you don't understand a sentence, explain it to me in other sentences. These are the features that you should use AI for. Uh, but again, th these are some of the, the shortcomings of, mm. of what not to do with AI as a student. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just... Um... I don't know where the time's gone because we've actually down to our last three minutes. Oh, <laughs> so well, yes. Um, um, I did invite people for any... another two hours. <laughs> <if you want. laughs> yeah, I did invite people to put things in the chat. So, um, got nothing come through at the moment. Oh, and we've got a question. Thank you. Um, so, um, interested in the use of generic teaching of using Gen AI. Find there's big difference in whether how our master's students are using it, and find that some international students are not aware of how it could be helping them. So, I guess, um, yeah, the the question is asking for a bit of guidance there on how oh, to absolutely. guide a student. I mean, I started this this podcast uh, conversation saying every student have a completely different neurocognitive profile. They have different skill level, backgrounds, attention span, habits, industry uh, or, or career concentrations and preferences. And 100 percent, they might come from different geographical locations where in, in, in big tech, in, in technology, innovation management, we, we have a, a, the, the regulation, governmental and a, other aspects where the same tool that we use here in the UK might appear very differently in a different region. Have you ever been on holiday and you opened your, your Instagram or Twitter or something and it looked differently? It felt differently? Mm -hmm. We do this intentionally. It's called A-B testing or, or build verification testing in software. They do release different versions for different parts of the world. And we have to take this into account. And by the way, this is kind of a, one of the reasons why I proposed a university-wide module, a module for how to use AI efficiently. And that is not just mm -hmm. directed for education, but it's also directed for the future, for when they go in their career. Now, what, what is the point of a university? It's to prepare you for what's next, for what's to come. Well, guess what? AI is what's to come. <laughs> so we have to prepare you for that too. Yeah, that's a that's a great note to finish on. So we're right at the end now. Unfortunately, we do have to stick to time, or at least I can switch off the record button. Well, let's just check if anyone has any other question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm happy to answer one more question of this. Ask me anything, even if it's something very difficult about AI. <laughs> yeah, this is a challenge, so come on. <laughs> Maybe they'll think about it later because obviously this is recorded. It'll be distributed for yes. the entire uh, university students stuff, so they can send out questions. And maybe in another chapter we can we can answer all these. Yes, as we've reached time, I'm going to switch off the recording Thank now. You. Um, yeah.